So before I start, I would like to just make an acknowledgement. Last Wednesday, um, Johann Geitzisch from Genève passed away, and Geitzisch was the main responsible for unearthing Rebai. And I owe a lot to him, actually, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this research. Um, so most people associate the guitar with Spain, right? But today I'll talk about a different tradition, one that came from German-speaking countries. So I'll talk about two traditions that coexisted, one that was guitaristic and the other mainstream. Eventually they intersected, and from this intersection came something completely new through the works of Ferdinand Rebay. But before I would like to start with some music, so I'll invite Izzy Chisman to join me in playing a sonata by Rebay. And later I'll tell you why I think this is a very important piece. Just an excerpt, not the whole sonata. So, this was the exposition of the sonata in E minor for oboe and guitar by Ferdinand Rebay, written in 1925. One could ask, so what's the special about it? It's just another sonata from the thousands that existed by a lesser known composer. But I'll tell you what's special. Uh, what if I tell you that this is the first Viennese sonata written in 100 years when it was written? And what if I tell you that this is one of the first sonatas ever written by a, a composer who did not play the guitar. That already makes it a little bit special. And uh, in fact, for someone going to a guitar performance in the 1920s, sonata wouldn't be necessarily the first thing uh, he or she would expect to hear. And I'll tell you why. This is the review of the, this very concert in which this sonata was premiered in 1925. We don't know who wrote it. Uh, it it's only signed N. But uh, from reading the review, it's possible to infer that he was not a guitarist and he didn't know much about what the guitar is about. But apparently he left convinced because he wrote that the art of the guitar has gone a long and successful way. 
when he talks about the premiere of Rebai's Sonata, he says that the Rebai sounded like a peculiar and completely effective piano. And to me, that means that he had no clue that the guitar could, for example, play a melody and accompany itself. But I wanted to focus on two uh, pieces of information that are very um, significant to, to make us understand the stereotypes associated with the guitar in those times. The first one is that he says that guitar is uh, for amateur playing, that no one can make a living by playing guitar. Guitar is something for dilettanti. And the other thing is that he talks a lot about the guitar as an instrument to accompany songs. So, to talk about the guitar and uh, amateur playing, I would have to go back to the 19th century, but you don't have much time for that. So I thought of bringing you an image, because uh, an image is worth a thousand words, right? So this is from a publication the 1820s in Paris, and it's called La Guitare Manie, the Guitar Mania. And apparently it shows a guitar class for ladies, right? There's just one guy over there, and there's a little toddler here, too. <laughs> and this doesn't surprise me, because the guitar in the 19th century was considered an appropriate instrument for women together with the piano, together with the harp, and singing uh, in the domestic environment. But of course, men also played the guitar, except that the conviviality was not always so peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I want to jump now to the end of the 19th century and talk a little bit about the emergence of the guitar clubs. Clubs or associations in the 19th century, they were a very important institution um, for the bourgeois society, middle class. And uh, they comprise diverse, diverse activities such as music, like choir or associations, for example, chess, astronomy, and so on. The main thing about these associations is that they were made up of amateurs, so people who got together to share uh, their own passions. And um, the other thing is that usually the membership participated a lot as active uh, members in the, act in the activities that they did. So it was not enough just to pay a monthly fee and go watch concerts, they actually wanted to play. So this picture here is from a very important guitar association, the Internationale Guitaristische Vereinigung, uh, International Guitar Association, also known as IGV. And this is from their um, year, yearly festival, the Gitarristentag, in Augsburg, the south of Germany. Um, I think that this is uh, interesting to notice that different than the other uh, image that I showed you, here we have just one woman here. And this also does not surprise me because uh, while women were expected to play guitar, piano, or other things at home, they wouldn't go to, to these clubs or association. Mostly, this would be a male-dominated environment. But the other thing that I thought very interesting from this picture is that you see lots of different guitars there, right? This is like a harp guitar. Uh, these guitars here, they have this coat of arms uh, shape. Uh, and it's uh, very particular. You see here, you see here too as well. Wappen guitar, it was called in, in German. And we see many guitars with extra strings as well, extra basses running parallel to the fingerboard. All of these instruments, they do not come from the Spanish tradition. They come from the Austro-German tradition, which already tells us about parallel traditions that existed when I talked about the association of guitar with Spain, right? But what kind of music did these people play? So in my thesis, I went through more than 400 pieces from the IGV's journal, the Guitar Freund and uh, to know what kind of music was, was that. And I selected a very amusing one for you. This is a piece by Johann Decker Schenk, who was an Austrian guitarist and singer who also had an operetta company in St. Petersburg. I'll play and then can talk a little bit about it.
probably, probably the only guitarist who plays this piece. <laughs> so what can you tell about it? It's amusing, it's very trivial. It's, the harmony is very simple, simplistic even. There's no really a musical argument. It's more about ornaments, actually. If you take out the ornaments in this piece, there is no piece, right? <laughs> um, the Germans, they have a name for that. They call this kind of music U-Musik, from Unterhaltung, that means entertainment. This is contrasting to the E-Musik, Ernst Musik, which means serious music, the concert hall music. But that's enough of uh, instrumental music for now. Let's talk a little bit about the guitar as an accompaniment instrument. This here is taken from a very famous pub uh, publication of the early 20th century of uh, col a collection of folk songs from Germany. They are Zupfgeigen Hansel. And I think many of you would be familiar with this notation, right? It's uh, for songs. You have the text, you have uh, the melody and stuff notation, but most people would know these songs by heart anyway. And then here you have these chord symbols here that on the guitar, uh, the person did not even need to know what notes they are playing. They would just memorize positions on the guitar and play the, the chords. This is really elementary stuff. It's like I, I, if there is anyone here who never touched a guitar, I promise that in two or three weeks I could have you playing this song. Um, and next to it, here, we have the Schrammel Quartet. And the Schrammel Quartet was a typical Viennese ensemble. As you see here, there are two violins. There is a, a clarinet, a high-pitched clarinet. And there is a guitar here, the Schrammel guitar, which also has many strings running in parallel. Um, people here around the table probably would sing along, except for the little boy there who is probably serving beer all the time. Um, how did it sound? I'll show you. So, this is the Schrammel Musik. Very still exists a lot. But I would like now to show, actually, let me just change the slide here. I would like you to show, to show you the, the real thing now. I'd like to invite uh, Michael to join me, Michael Bell. And we are going to play uh, a very famous folk song from the time, which was actually uh, arranged, uh, harmonized by Brahms as well, for vocal quartet and piano. And he used in his first sonata for piano also as a theme for variations. The text is very naive. It talks about uh, the, the moon uh, mysteriously rising you know, between the clouds, the silver clouds, and there are little flowers everywhere. And then there is a girl in the room, and the girl's name is Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> Stolen geht der Mond auf, blau, blau, himmelrein. Durch Silberwüchen geht sein Lauf, blau, blau, himmelrein. Rosen im Tal, Mädel im Saal. Oh, 
So I think this is enough to give you uh, an idea of these stereotypes that I talked before uh, surrounding the guitar in the early 20th century. The thing is that during the same time, there was a movement going on to rehabilitate the guitar as a concerting instrument. So we, have, we had in, in, on an international level, we have people like Miguel Llobet and Andres Segovia, but in German-speaking countries, the most important guy was this guy here, Heinrich Albert. Albert was from Munich, and he had a symphon he came from symphonic tradition, actually. He, he was a horn player. And uh, he criticized the guitarist composers, quoting, that could only compose miniatures in salon style. And to Albert, this kind of music did not have a, an appeal to the educated German audiences, that's the, the concert goers. Now we're out to Vienna, Rebai's hometown. I was super excited when I got a hold of this document here. Uh, I have reasons to believe that this is the first ever conservatory level guitar program in Europe. So this was a true milestone because uh, now guitarists actually could get a professional education and, and go to a, to a conservatory and hang out with other musicians and composers and everything. Uh, this was thanks to Jakob Ortner, who you see here, surrounded by students. And I want to show two of his students to you. This is uh, Louise Walke. She would become Austria's most important guitarist in the 20th century. Here she is only 15 years old. And this guy here, nobody hears about him today. His name is Hans Schlagradl. And he was not only the guy who premiered the sonata, the Rebai sonata that I played for you before, but he also premiered Schoenberg's uh, Serenade, Opus 24, which is one of his first 12 tone works and a very complex piece in many movements for seven uh, instruments and voice. So I think nothing could be farther from the typical repertoire of the guitar clubs that I showed you before. And here we come chronological to the moment, chronologically to the moment where Rebai meets the guitar. So who was Ferdinand Rebay, anyway? Rebay, he was born in 1880, and he had a very traditional and conservative musical education. He was a prize winner student of Robert Fuchs, we see there. Robert Fuchs, he was a personal friend of Brahms, a protege of Brahms, actually. And uh, he was a very important teacher in Vienna. He taught people like Mahler, Sibelius, and Korngold. So after Rebai graduated in 1904, he worked for many years as a choir master in Vienna. Here we see a poster of a concert where he's conducting the Schubert Bund, a very traditional choir that still exists. And uh, he did that until, the 19, until 1920, when he got a professorship of piano at the Vienna Academy. And that's when he met Jakob Ortner, that I showed you before, and he started to compose for guitar. So Hebei wrote 150 works for guitar, which is quite a lot. And most of them were dedicated to his niece, Gerta Hammerschmidt. So even though Hebei wrote so much for the guitar, most of his works were not published and uh, circulated very little outside of Vienna. So when he died in 1953 and when Gerta got older and stopped playing, his music also stopped being played and he was totally forgotten, and she donated his manuscripts to two Viennese libraries where they remained uh, hidden for decades until the early 2000s when they first started to be published. 
So back in 2011, I was one of the first guitarists to play a sonata by Rebay. And now I'm the first to write a full PhD thesis about Rebay. But I think this is just the beginning because there's still much to be learned and much to be performed as well. So from our point of view, guitarists, why is Rebay important? Why should they care about Rebay? I give you three reasons. The first one is that he's a non-guitarist composer. Up to the 1920s, composing for guitar was a guitarist business, really. And even today, there is a myth that um, only if you can only compose well for the guitar if you play the guitar. And Rebay was one of those who proved the contrary. The other thing is that Rebay wrote 80 chamber music works. And that's really significant because in those times, when you think about Segovia, for example, uh, most of the repertoire was solo repertoire. Segovia played one chamber piece, mostly, that the Castanovo Tedesco's Quintet, but everything else was mostly solo. And Rebay also comes from Vienna, and chamber music had been a tradition in Vienna for since at least Haydn, right? The third is that Rebay wrote more than 30 sonatas for the guitar. And now I want to spend a little time on his sonatas because this is the main topic of my thesis. This is the exposition of the sonata that I played for you before. So I laid out the sections so it, to make it easier to see. We have the first theme here, first presented by the oboe, then the guitar takes up, accompanying itself. The guy was very impressed, the guy who wrote the review. Huh? Then we had the transition here, going to G major. We have a second theme, more lyrical theme. We have a short episode and we have a codeta here. The structure, the structure is super clear and in fact, it is a very academic rendition of the sonata form. Um, about the sonata, by Rebay's time, writing sonatas was already an outdated thing. Even by Brahms' time, it was already outdated. I always link it to the Viennese classics, uh, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. However, sonatas still had this connotation of prestige, of craftsmanship, because sonatas were always associated with Beethoven. So my thesis, what I say, what I argue in my thesis is that Rebay intentionally wanted to write sonatas for the guitar because he wanted to elevate the guitar to the eyes of the mainstream audiences. Because the guitar had enough miniatures. So the guitar needed uh, solid, serious, extended uh, works based on the Austro-German tradition. Here I show you um, uh, an overview of the structure of six sonatas by Rebay for woodwinds and guitar. You see, this is the number of bars. These are the sections of the sonata form. You can see here that the exposition, the recapitulation, they are almost perfectly symmetrical. So that means that Rebay actually uses the same material. He just makes the little tonal adjustments and it's exactly the same thing in the outer sections. And the development here is much shorter. So when I was studying this structure, rather than, I discovered that rather than being an individual style, stylistic feature, I, I saw this pattern also happening in domestic string chamber music from the 19th century, like in works uh, f from composers like Spohr, Onslow, or Kulau. This music was music that was very melodic, very conversational, passing themes from one instrument to the, to the other. And, um, and it is a, it is a, a tradition that comes from, from the house music, actually, in German-speaking countries. This was not music that uh, was meant for a cerebral listen. It was music meant for the pleasure of the performers. So by knowing this context, I could link Rebay's style to the very tradition that he came from, this house music tradition. And this is Rebay's fundamental importance for the guitar because uh, he actually invites the guitar to join this tradition and he gives us guitarists something that we didn't have before which was the sonata, the romantic sonata, the post-Beethovenian sonata. But what about uh, the general picture? How do we situate Rebay among his own pairs and during his own times? This is difficult to say because we know almost nothing about his non-guitar music. But I, 
I'll bring you another review, this time from 1943. By the way, it's when uh, Germany was occupying Austria, the Anschluss. And uh, I think it summarizes Hebei's style somehow. This is a kind of bittersweet statement to end my presentation. Uh, the reviewer called Hebei's music the Kabinettstücke der Kammermusik und Hausmusik. So I went uh, online, I Google to see what a Kabinettstück is, and this is what I got. <laughs> so again, I think an image is worth a thousand words. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>